Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit Is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit Is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store. All right, welcome back to Detroit Is Different, and we are in the podcast studio. Today I have a guest that... uh, as unique as it may be, his dad is probably one of the bigger connections for me. His dad, uh, and he shares namesake, so he's Junior Dialis Allen Jr. How you feeling, my G? I'm actually the third. The uh, third, okay. Yeah, three. yeah. My dad, that's what they call him, Junior. So okay. I was, yeah. I'm so that's a couple. So if it's a Dialis, <laughs> it's out four here, of us. Yeah, I was gonna say if it's a Dialis out here, they gotta be connected to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, I don't I don't think I've ever met another Dialis. Have you ever met another Dialis outside of your family? Uh, actually, it was a. It's a guy named Dialis Johnson. Uh, I believe he was named after my grandfather. But like, uh, it's a baseball player named Dialis Guerrero, and okay. people then tried to tell me like, y'all got a Spanish name. It's like, nah, bro. My grandfather was born in 1925. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It. This name is originated from my great grandmother. So you know okay all right because yeah i was gonna say i never never knew one until your pops yeah so and when we talk about pops um your roots to 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 this detroit area uh Mm -hmm. how far back do the roots go where do they start well it starts on my father's side uh my grandmother was born here her father and his brothers uh, rolled down on a, a white man who did something to their younger brother, and then they had to flee. So when they fled, uh, he started his family up here in Detroit. One of the other brothers, uh, I want to say, went to Cleveland or somewhere in Ohio. Uh, my father's father was a part of World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, they drafted him when he walked off of a watermelon truck from a white man because the white man was talking to him crazy. And so <laughs> him and his brother was mysteriously drafted like two days later, sent to war. Crazy part is, you know, uh, my, my grandmother met my grandfather's parents at church, Russell Street Baptist Church, and they hooked, they hooked up through that way. They was pen palling. But when he came back from the war, they got together and the rest is history. As for my mother's side, mm-hmm. my grandmother is from Shibuta, Mississippi. Where from, is uh, whereabouts is Shibuta, Mississippi from Jackson? I, from Jackson, I have no idea to be honest. Okay. My okay. my Dialis Allen Sr. is from Rosedale, Mississippi. Ah. And my grandmother is from my father's mother is from Thompson, Georgia. Hmm. Um some of them still live on the same plantation that they originated from. Hmm. But my uh the my mother's supposed father um had some dealings with a white woman and the white men of that town in mississippi wasn't feeling that i can only imagine right then. so the masons snuck him up here hmm. and then my grandmother god rest her soul momo she ended up uh following so that's how we got to Detroit. Uh, my mom's is from the Brewsters and my daddy from 12th Street. Okay, now when you talk about fled, fled Mississippi. So on both yes. sides of your family, it was people fleeing the South. Yes. And, and, and you know, not just tyranny, but the imminent danger of death. Yeah, it was, uh, it was bad. Uh, just, just from what I've heard, it, it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't a good look. Okay. And in this story kind of is is a story that exists in other black families, yeah. too. Um, do you think uh, as that story has been told and shared and passed down, uh, what impact did that even have like on your father and your aunts, your uncles, knowing that like, yo, you know, yeah. we, we left the South because it, it was getting hot, you yeah. know, and then really just the threat of you know, possibly that following them yeah. here. My my uh my folks have always been down for their people first. Mm-hmm. Um they also have they never taught uh turn the other cheek. 
I'll say that as well. They always taught self-defense, be kind and courteous, but if it come to you, then stand up and handle your business. Um, I know that my father took great pride in telling me the story about his grandfather, my great-grandfather, who did retaliate for his brother. Uh, my father was curious about going back to the South, but my grandfather, Diala Salen Sr., was like, I'm never going back. You could go back, but I'm not going back. Uh, and even my story, I wasn't born in Detroit or Highland Park or nothing. I was actually born in Ann Arbor. My parents was at U of M getting their education, and they decided, you know, we got educated, so we want to come back to the hood. So when I was like four years old, we moved to Highland Park, and uh, i say that was a major culture shock for me. But their whole philosophy was people get educated or they get some money and leave the hood. That's a problem because now there's no examples. It's not no resources in the hood to, to, to help out or just to be there, you know what I'm saying? And they, feel, they felt more comfortable being from the inner city. So they moved back, and they stayed in Highland Park all the way to, like, 2010 now we all on the west side you know we feeling a little bougie now but you know <laughs> okay so yeah. let's 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 talk a little bit about your parents and their backgrounds here yes sir. you said your dad my neighbor 12th street 12th and what 12th and lee is where my father was from uh spent a lot of time on 12th and claremont playing mm -hmm. basketball yeah went to hutchinson okay yeah all right so um that neighborhood uh, do, was was your grandparents there as a kid? Like, um, no. What do you know about that neighborhood? Um, my grandparents is from the North End. Ah, okay. Uh, on that side of the family, my grandparents from the North End. That's where they first lived. Mm -hmm. They moved over to 12th and Lee. I want to say like right before my father was born, or when he was born. And uh, from what I understand about that neighborhood, it, it was kind of rough. Um, mm -hmm drugs violence but also when my father was coming up that was a place where it was a lot of black businesses black ownership you know what i'm saying um but after the riots from my understanding a lot changed and based on what my father said we were narcoticized after that we was to, to keep us docile hmm. so he he basically gave me the game like people thought heroin was medicine after the riots, you could get a dollar or a penny cap and, and people would tell you it's medicine because it's guys coming from the war. Um, and that is medicine for them because they from Vietnam where they've been doing that to keep their mind or whatever. So, you know, it, it was a, like a trick almost. You know what I mean? So the drugs was heavy over there from my understanding. So that that snapshot in time and I think of. of uh, it, it's, it's so unique when we look at different moments in pop culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to highlight this, but yes, heroin, even going back to the days of Bumpy Johnson and yeah. even before then, uh, it, the, 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 the crisis of opium that, that struck China uh, led oh, to man. Mao saying all, you know, all white people need to leave. Uh, yeah. Definitely the British, but this, that substance and ravaging. And, it it has impacted, you know, America, but definitely that black community. I would say maybe from like the forties up through the seventies till we get the 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 proliferation of cocaine in Man. our community. Let me uh, let me just add this too, because you brought up China. Yeah. When the Chinese first tried to fight against that, the British was like, No, we're gonna keep this legal here. When you got people on dope, it's like, it's crazy. And you say up to like the 80s before cocaine, man, in Highland Park, it was a strip on Florence that was booming, man. I'm talking about all the way to probably even a little bit into the 2000s, you know what I mean? So th that heroin is uh, it's serious, mm. you know? Yeah, and, and I mean, it's definitely existed in... in and the the rap it can have on you uh mm -hmm. when we look at like a movie like american gangster that tells some of the frank lucas story 
uh, right now, Godfather of Harlem, uh, you know, epics with Forrest Whitaker, and it's telling the story of Bumpy Johnson uh, and just that relationship uh, of what was and, and just even right now, you know, as people say, the opioid crisis, just the known effect of uh, what opium can do uh, as a depressant in the body mm -hmm. of so many, uh, which which the pills have kind of led to people, you know, running out of pills and going straight mm -hmm. for heroin itself. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's it, it's something to be cognizant of. And in our community, it definitely looks and feels different. But right now that it has a stronghold of a mm -hmm. lot of America. My heroin heroin tore up the lives as well as crack, but heroin tore up the lives of many of my peers. Um, my dad, we we speaking a lot about my father and, and my parents, but my dad put a hoop in my backyard. And, um, you know, my house was one of those houses that anybody could come to. It didn't matter if most people mama said don't play with him. You could come to my house and you could play basketball. My daddy would be, you know, making hot dogs. You could come get a hot dog and be a kid. I remember one summer, I want to say it was probably the summer like 95 or 96. It went from being 20 guys in my backyard hooping, and the next summer it's like maybe five because a lot of those guys is now doing what? They selling heroin because they trying to get fresh. They trying to get fly for high school. or You know, they just got caught up, man. So that, that heroin thing have been around. The opioid crisis has been around. Uh, it has impacted my family. It's impacted my community. So, yeah, man, uh, hopefully one day we'll get through it. Yeah. But, and, yeah. And now shifting to your mom, the Brewster. Yeah. Uh, the Brewsters, uh, the, you know, you know, uh, one of the first uh, housing projects uh, in the design of, like, the apartment building style mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Uh, we think of Eleanor Roosevelt coming for the opening and all of mm -hmm. that stuff. What's the, what, what's the stories your mom uh, kind of connected to, and then just a lot of people that came from the Brewsters yeah. too. It was it was a lot of greats that came from the Brewsters, but believe it or not, the Brewsters have a notorious reputation. But if you ask my mother, and like other families from the Brewsters. Like, I also had, like, an extended family, the Glaskers. They from the Brewsters. They talk about the Brewsters with so much affinity and love, man. You would think, like, I wish I grew up in the Brewsters. You and know what I'm saying? And that's what I've heard yeah. usually. I, I think, like we say, I mean, some of these snapshots mm -hmm. of our story are told and, and is glorifying uh, some of the destruction. Right. But it's a lot of constructive things that were happening over there. The arts program. Mm -hmm. uh Joe Lewis's gym, uh, which usually was training people. Yeah, man, the talent. Yeah. So, what they would basically say is, it was really about family. Mm -hmm. um, they mothers could walk the streets as late as they wanted, as early as they wanted. Like everything they said about the Brewsters was great. I haven't heard many foul stories about the Brewsters from people that I actually know. That. Um, that lived there um but when we talk about um it's all good yeah 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 i got you i got you but yeah that that that's and the other crazy part about um the brewsters projects when people from the brewsters run into each other it's like family and then it's like they look at me like family you know what I'm saying? So when the Hendersons come over or the Hendersons is around or the Glaskers, it's just like automatic family. So everything I heard about the Brewsters was great. It contradicted what was in the newspapers. Excuse me. I'm not going to say that they never said it wasn't no violence or bad things that happened, but it was maybe 3 5% of their stories. 95% of their stories was like, Great, you know what I'm saying? Playgrounds, plan, family, school, talent, partying. You know, they talked about all these resources there. So 
my mother's childhood was, was good while she was in the Brewsters, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about, you said you come from the A square. Uh, what had you, uh, what had the family in Ann Arbor? Uh, my parents was in school. Mm. Um, it's very important to recognize too, my father took a test when he was in the ninth grade and he scored so high that he was recruited by Phillips Academy Andover. The school is older than the country itself. Mm -hmm. uh, they recruited a lot of blacks that they consider highly intelligent mm -hmm. and they had them come out there or whatever. But you know, things happen. My father ended up coming back to Detroit. I ain't gonna get, get into the details of that. But when he met my moms and she found out like, man, you went to Phillips Academy and you here at Wayne County Community College. Like, bro, you supposed to be through the, through the roof. She actually filled out his paperwork and everything and enrolled him in U of M. We got up there. I was born while we was up there. My father completed his undergrad in like three years. My mother was there uh, doing her undergraduate. And that's what led us there. Um, but living on North Campus and living on LaSalle, some of the fondest memories of my life, uh, the ship family, it was all types of cultures, white. Indian, Middle Eastern, Asian, like, and it was like just families and children. Like, I could remember, man, just being like off. And I don't remember seeing like adults around. You know what I'm saying? It was a safe place. And um, that was my experience as a child. What what years in Ann Arbor is this is this happening? 82 to 86. Okay. So I moved to Highland Park, I want to say late 86. Okay, so eighty two, eighty six, Ann Arbor. This mm -hmm. is, this is definitely the Bo Schembechler era of uh, of U of M, mm -hmm. um, and it, and U of M is definitely one of those places uh, that stand out as a landmark of our state. Yeah. But as a kid there, you said like even then you were connecting to different cultures and, and, yeah. and thought process. Yeah, I mean it was it was all types of people around. We was in family housing. So everybody pretty much was on the same tip. Mm -hmm. And you're also around thinkers. Mm -hmm. See, the thing about being around critical thinkers is they know how to disagree and coexist without it being overt conflict. Uh, can you break that down a little bit more? Because when you're around people who don't really exercise critical thinking skills, just because you disagree, sometimes they feel as if you have to have a serious conflict. Nah, when you're around thinking people, y'all could disagree and come up with new ideas. Or you could just disagree and that's the end of it. Like, um, I got a homeboy, he been on this show, Akaji. Mm -hmm. We went to school together. I mean, almost every day we would be around each other, we would have an argument, bro. Hmm. And it's like, people thinking like we getting into it, it's like, no, nah, this is my man's. We just don't agree on this. That's... That don't mean I'm hating on him or I have a personal problem with him. But I've seen this happen in a lot of instances, even in the intervention work I do today with BMO. Mm. Guys will disagree and feel like it's a personal thing. It's not. You know what I mean? But that's because they're not really thinking. they just reacting. And uh, in Ann Arbor, it was a lot of critical thinking. You, you're talking about people at one of the most prestigious schools in our state, though. So, that's, that was the vibe there, man. It, it wasn't, like, violent to me at all. It was, like, peaceful and harmonious as a kid. Now, I will say this, because I brought up Akaji. At Eastern Michigan, when I'm riding through Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti at the age of 19 to 23 or whatever, I don't get that same vibe. Mm. You know, I don't get that same vibe. So it's different. So it's let's different uh, experience. Let's yeah. unpack uh 86, what neighborhood you guys moved to? Oh man, we <laughs> We moved to HP, man. It was uh, Highland Park. HP, okay. Man. Highland six Park mile and Woodward. Okay, that six part. mile in Woodward. Yes, the sir. that's back when the Chinese food's place was over there. Um you know, that the Listen. the Little Caesars was over there. Little Caesars was one of the first places the narcos rolled up on me as if I was 
a, 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 a hustler off, off Six Mile. My brother worked there, man, between yeah. Woodward and Second. Yes, sir. And uh, let's see, what else is around yeah. there? And then, I mean, we know Palmer Park is right there. Too. Palmer Park right there. So we also going to say um, it's also a freak fest over there. Hmm. So I'm going to say this. When we moved to Highland Park, initially, because it was cold, I felt like, oh, we moving up. We got a big backyard. We got a big house. This the spot. You know what I'm saying? I'm four or five years old. But by the summertime, it's different, man. When it warm up, it's different. So we was right next door to a crack house. Hmm. That's one. Um, my parents' thing was like all that roaming around you used to do. Y'all could go from our house, our front yard, to the Knight's house. The Knight's is a family friend of my mother's. She knew them since she was like 13. It was literally two houses down. We couldn't go no further than that. Hmm. My first hustle over there was breaking the rules a little bit. I used to take out the trash of the people who lived next door to the Knights, and they would give me a dollar. They was like the last white couple on the block. Mm -hmm. uh, HP was vicious, man. I'm not even going to lie to you. It was a totally different vibe. Uh, it went down. My cousin got murdered on the next block within mm -hmm. two years. Um, one of my homeboys, when I was 11, anybody that's from HP that lived during this time, they know about how it rocked the hood when Ruben got killed in the drive-by. He was 10 years old, man. Like, HP was just different. You talking about an area where cousins ki shoot each other and, you know what I mean? On our side of the tracks, dudes from this block beefing with the dude on this block that's right next to it. Yeah, it was just different, man. I say that. Yeah, and and, and kind of like with the Brewsters things is it definitely was a lot of the uh, the those you know those violent traumas that come to life, but then it's still in that neighborhood, especially over there. It still is certain families that really care about gardening. Oh yeah, flowers. Uh, yeah. you know, planting and, and turning over with the seasons. It'll blow your mind some of the some of the things over there. So, like seeing that duality, seeing some of those layers of those families that were there for generations, mm -hmm. in the midst of yeah, you know, it, somebody may be trapping on this street too. Uh, yeah, you know, w what was the relationship like for you and the other kids uh, as you kind of grow and connect? And I know they notice your difference, and uh, you know. Uh, you kind of having that background of being from Ann Arbor now in HP. Yeah, I really didn't know because I was too little. My oldest brother, my older brother Nelson did, though. He never really connected with the people over there. Uh -huh. I was over there at four or five. I didn't really have a problem adapting. And honestly, a lot of that stuff was normalized to me until I turned about 24, 25, and I started saying this stuff not normal. Um, it was beautiful aspects to Highland Park. I will say this. HP was one of those places that still live by a very strict code of if you're not involved in the street lifestyle, I'm going to say nine times out of ten, you won't be affected by it at all. Like, wasn't no stealing cars, wasn't no breaking the houses until later because... It was a cold, man. It was a real strict gangster cold. And um, it was a lot of mamas on the block, mm -hmm. older grandma type figures who didn't tolerate disrespect. Um, you know, I'm going to say I was a hooper. I was a hooper, so I got that respect as being somebody who played basketball and went to school. You feel what I'm saying? So in a lot of ways I was safe and insulated and nobody bothered me um and if something went down because i i do have a mentally ill auntie the gangsters would make sure nothing would happen to her you know mm. what i mean because she would she did have a tendency of going off yeah. you know what i mean but there was some good aspects but i can honestly say man um i wouldn't want to raise my children there mm-hmm uh, seeing all of the, I mean, it was just a real predatory type of area. Like, um, 
you have guys that would just be walking down the street and some, and this is no disrespect to, you know, homosexuals, but homosexuals would come up to them and try to proposition them because they might see they was down and out and try to turn them out. And mm -hmm. the transsexuals, you know, they, it would always be tension. Yeah. And also, to their credit, though, uh, it was some guys that whatever their frustration was, whether it was at home or just poverty or whatever, they looked at the transsexuals and homosexuals as an outlet for their frustration, where they would just go out and attack them or mm. get to robbing them uh, out of control. Mm. So it was a lot of different dynamics in HP. And if you was a part of that underworld, it's like, it's no holes barred. But if you wasn't, and this is what I do respect about my upbringing, if you wasn't a part of that underworld, people didn't try to get you to come to that side or what's the word I'm looking for. They, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be impacted by it mm -hmm. directly, so to speak. And that's, uh, that's kind of been one of the things I've stood on for a long time about, you know, street culture yeah. in – in many places, but mm -hmm. like especially here, because people will say, even my neighborhood, like, man, it's crazy over there. But I'm like, well, you know, if you don't involve yourself in a lot of mm -hmm. what street culture is, yeah, I believe things are a lot more safe. I'm not saying, yeah. I mean, but you know, and these are kind of some of the the differences as you talked about Ann Arbor, because I feel a lot more tension. I feel a lot more anxiety. Uh, and fear mm -hmm. uh, being a black man, being in the suburbs, and I do, and I guess what you say, the the grimiest hood, because I feel <laughs> like I have a a better understanding mm -hmm. of the culture, of yeah. street culture, than I do, like, Karen culture. You know what I'm saying? I, I so get like, exactly what you're saying. I mean, I could easily see myself in, like, what they label as, like, one of the safest neighborhoods, because I, I look at all... All things in America are not designed. There's nothing. The only thing in America designed for black people and particularly black men is destructive. Mm, yeah, it's yeah. It, it's going to be destructive. It's tight. Uh, most it, things. Most things. The things designed by America for black men. I'm gonna say all. In my opinion, all things. I think prison yeah. is. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, prison, even if yeah. you want to say the NBA, but the NBA is exploitive you know, um, or any other forms of black men making a lot of money is, is exploitive. Mm. Uh, you know, um, hip hop culture, even like, you know, entertainment culture, it's a lot of destructive elements. It's not, it is, it's not anything by American design. So when people say this is the safest neighborhood in America, yeah. really what they're saying is black men aren't here. You know what I'm yeah, saying? No, no, so I when you're, you're a black man and you enter this quote unquote safe neighborhood, mm -hmm. you are an imminent threat. And that's where I yeah. just do not feel identify. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, and I get that brother in the sense of, See, in the hood, especially because of the intervention work that I do, I can kind of spot red flags. Yeah. And a lot of times I recognize if I speak without confrontation in my voice, I can be heard and understood. Mm -hmm. Now, there are certain individuals in the hood who have lost their natural mind. Yeah. And you avoid them and let them live in their reality. And so as long as you don't bother them nine times out of ten, they're not going to bother you. But, you know, like you said, I know how to handle the young, wild, ruckus type guys. You know what I'm saying? Because I was a young, wild, ruckus, not even looking for trouble. I just was young. And I think a lot of people forget that. That, that just brings me to a point. Like you're talking about safety, right? So it was a fight down in Greektown, and the police intervened. And some of the young brothers decided, like, well, I'm still fighting. I mean, what do you expect them to do after they done seen 100 videos of other young brothers getting killed doing nothing or with their hands up? Like, yeah. And here's the other part, Kari, and we from the same generation. I remember being at the uh, 4th of July fireworks and seeing a mob of dudes from whatever hood see another dude with his cardies. They stomp him, smash him out. The police is right there and let it happen. Yeah. So, I also remember <laughs> what's so funny that one time it was a, uh, uh, somebody fired 
you know, fired a, a pistol. It, it was mm -hmm. I was maybe the distance, this distance from my son. I may have been 15 feet away from yeah. it. So when the police started swarming people, I was one of the people, me and my friends, were some of the people swarmed. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I agree. I, I think... I think it's a context to a lot of it and and media and American systems can't contextualize it the same yeah. way that right now we're looking at, you know, uh, what looks to be uh, in my mind, our justice system having nothing but empathy for Kyle Rittenhouse, who was a young white kid that Man. point blank shot Come two on. white people and injured others. Come on. On, on the news. Man. But our, our society has a culture of understanding you know, even the 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 many magas that rush the capital yeah. because they will give context yeah. Yeah. to the violence of as the opposed to shooter. How they get down Whereas, here. yeah, if you're black, it's like we just have a natural inquisition to savagery and we yeah. just wild and black men are just <laughs> violent and they rapists and they and they and they you know even black men are afraid of black men and if you ain't and got I, a gun, I, I, I'm then, glad you, know you I'm brought saying? that up. Uh, if you ain't got a gun, then, you know, you associate yeah. with black men, you crazy. You know but, what I'm but saying? But I'm glad you brought that up. And think of this, man. Yeah. How many old dudes, and when I say old, I'm talking about dudes my age, 39, yeah. 40, yeah. who was talking bad about them young brothers that was down there fighting. And it's like y'all forgot that y'all used to go downtown and act a fool. I, this I, is what I, we do. I do think, yeah, I do you know think that I mean? it's a... It's a cognitive dissonance. It's a yeah. Because part of it is back to the design of America. Hence, th platforms like Detroit is different. I find very important because I could give a context to our story. Right. Uh, you know, NBC and CBS, they're not giving a context yeah. to like, if you're a black man, I don't care from what angle. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You will not be given any benefit of you the doubt. You won't get no context. You know, yeah. uh, it's yeah. like, Bill Cosby, you a rapist. Right. You know what I'm saying? The governor of New York is like, well, maybe he can step down, yeah. but I don't hear any, I don't hear the attorney general moving forward with yeah. charges to arrest this man. Yeah. You know, and I'm yeah. definitely not defending who Bill Cosby is, but I am I know what you're acknowledging the fact that it don't matter how far you get. Skip, mm -hmm. skip gates. You you got to break in your house to uh, mm -hmm. to get into your house, and it's your house and your property, and your neighbors across the street are looking at you. This is my this yeah. is my suburban fear. Yeah. Your neighbors that know you live there are looking at you. Yeah. Get into your own house and they call the cops yeah, on you. They don't want and you, you the friend of the president. So now you got to sit down and have a damn beer summit with this Man. with this racist ass cop that don't let you in your house and arrest you. And the end in of the front day, of your neighbors that know it's you. End of the day. End of the day. My whole thing is why do you want to live there? Because that, I mean, but this I mean, is that, back to, like me personally, it's like yeah. I don't want to live there, bro. But I I think this is back to that same propaganda of. I mean, it's hard. You can't disconnect if you if you're here in this nation. It's hard to disconnect when so many images and so much media incepts the idea of black man danger, 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 yeah. hypersexualized, hyperviolent, yeah. uh, not intelligent, I'm glad only you're athletic. This up. You yeah, know, like almost like a, a, a the the concept. I mean, when we think of man, I'm going on a rant here, but no, um, I'm glad you're bringing this up. This this is really what I wanted to talk about but, because. Uh, yeah, but birth of a nation, you know, one yeah. of America's first uh, National Movies. Treasure Academy Award winning films. Yeah. The whole premise of that is a white man in black face going around yeah. raping white women, yeah. which is the reason why we need the Ku Klux Klan to stop these black yeah. men from raping white women. Yeah. And it's and funny. This basically is projecting what they yes. did to us. Yes. On to us. Like, yes. Come on, man. Yes. So that's where it's so funny, like on, in the man. shadows of like, and I'm going to go yeah. see it soon. Like the Candyman movie, re-envisioned re 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 from Jordan Peele, but mm -hmm. it's still a lot of that along those lines. Hence, mm -hmm. you said your family even had to flee because it was said to be yeah. and someone in your family, whether it's the truth or not the truth. Yeah. Black man, white woman, Mississippi, that's enough to hang you. And yeah, I just yeah, hang yeah, you, yeah, 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 hang yeah. you, your friends that was around, yeah. shit, maybe your mama. Anybody that was a might have been a witness that might be trying to hide you, yeah. 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 You know, and it could be all, as we found out in the whole Emmett Till murder, it was all a lie in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And that woman is still able to walk around even after she admitted she lied. Yeah. You know, and that's even a, a, a disturbing fact. But I, I'm glad you brought all of that stuff up because that was one of the main things I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. is this misunderstood narrative of black men that we have. And uh, 
part of my mission is to combat that program that's pushed by the mass media. And like I said, it's I'm not about to sit here and act like there's not a small group of black men that's out of their mind or that selfish that they just live for themselves. But the majority of us is not like that. And but then, I, I would I would argue that the black men that are doing that are mimicking white culture. You know I wouldn't saying? disagree with that so at like, all. I look at a guy like uh, and love his music, love some of the other artistry that he's added. But when we think of the caricature that Curtis Jackson presents 50 Cent as. Yeah, 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 yeah. 50 Cent, who was in town in Detroit, you know, the other day, and I think still here now, uh, marketing his new cognac, uh, mm -hmm. Branson. So if you're going to drink, drink black. Uh his whole persona is, I want as much money as I possibly yeah. can. Capitalism. And, and I. By any means. Yes. You know, <laughs> get rich. Or die trying. Or die trying. Yeah, that is, is definitely a his, Western yes. philosophy of hoarding resources and all Rugged of that. Rugged individualism and everything. Yeah, all so of that, man. The imagery that he portrays is a black man embracing a, a, a structure and the idea of John Smith's wealth of nations, mm -hmm. like this is his interpretation right. of that. Right. And, and, and our interpretation of it due to, like I said, the outlets are usually destructive resources. Right. Is going to be something dest more destructive well, well, than constructive. Let's, let's, let's be honest. Destructive resources systemically put in our neighborhoods that not only give they, they give us a two way escape, an economic escape or a mental escape from the hardships that we face due to whether it's poverty or, or social issues. Mm -hmm. So and then then we have to add this to the context. This idea of the absent, disturbed black man was mainly created and manufactured out of America. Because when you put crack in the in the mix of things, man, that just changed a lot. That stole a lot of the spirit from us, man. And then you changed the laws. So even the guys who were small-time crack dealers ended up catching a boatload of time. So you removed. It wasn't that they chose to leave. And it's like you said, when we go in the history of it, the law was a slave child, or if you born from a black woman, the law was you do not have a father, period. You don't have a father, bro. So the father was removed during that time, and it was also the father was removed during that era. The fathers who remained were the strongest and the most disciplined who was able to stay, man, and recognize that trap of crack. They didn't want to get involved in that, man. But that narrative is old to me. I'm always around good brothers, coaches, mm -hmm. teachers, fathers, mentors uh guys like you artists that's socially conscious mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying but our stories aren't really told you feel what i'm saying and, and we have to change the narrative in our own mind and i gotta bring this up better man outreach does that in a circle every every time we meet we have a positive good news moment in our circle and this literally took him back and changed the mind of the young brothers hey little bro it's not all what you see on the news and what's perpetuated. It's young brothers out here going to school, taking care of their family. Um, you know, they living their life, bro. It's they living their bright. They living their life, you know. So but we got to combat that narrative. So within that, and we're going to definitely get back to BMO, but before that, just your life journey in there. So okay. high school, college, what, what, where oh, you at? Oh, man, so... I went to the best high school on the planet, man. Okay. Everybody know what that is. Second Avenue, CT <laughs> fired up, double O, you know what I mean? My whole household is Cass Tech. My wife oh, went to Cass. Um, man, Cass was, was a beautiful experience, mm -hmm. but it was also a difficult experience for me. Why you say that? Because I just, I came from a small Catholic school that was like family. So going from that to Cass, it was kind of, it was just like a culture shock. It was crazy. And you know, I wanted to fit in, man. I'm, but I didn't really fit in with that group at Cass. Why, why did you feel you didn't fit in? I didn't really test in. My brother got me in, man. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I just lost my way. It was so big. I, like I said, I was a hooper. 
Mm-hmm. I didn't know nothing about the tryouts. I found out about the tryouts the day of. Mm-hmm. And it was like once I slipped out of that sports zone and started catching the bus home, I started walking by the the house where the dropouts was at, and yeah. I started associating with them, and I started picking up a lot of their habits. And they was familiar to me. I had mm-hmm. been seeing them my whole life, and they was always there. It's something that T.I. said that st- stood out to me. The trap was more consistent than my home life. Hmm. And I had both of my parents at home. And a lot of people might not understand this unless you experience this. But both of my parents spent a lot of their time working. I had community-oriented parents. They wanted me to be community-oriented. That's why they sent me to Aisha Shule Summer School. They sent me to... Catholic school, a small school that taught morals and family values. and You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But my parents was like, my mother is a nurse. She delivered babies. You know what I'm saying? But she also worked at DPS, and she would put our heart and soul into them young girls. I used to actually be jealous of them because mm. I wanted that soft mind. But with me, it was do your work. Woo, 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 woo. You know what I'm saying? It was yeah. tough love. And my dad, as you know, was a college professor. Yeah. And he also became a dean. So I wasn't really getting a lot of um, interaction at home. My brothers had went off to college. So I started interacting with the guys on the block. Yeah. And by that time in ninth grade, I want to say, man, all the way that I went to college, man, I just, you know, I interacted with that crowd and- that kind of stifled my high school experience because it that was, was like where your teeter totter. Yeah, it was and, that, that, um, yeah, like, and it's funny you mention that as that becomes one of the tougher layers of street culture in our yeah. community because it's so much there. It's like right there if you're yeah. from. But the <laughs> thing is, even if you're from the suburbs, it's right there. Because yeah. like we say, these destructive resources in the black community, if you black, they, they abundant. You yeah. can tap into it. Facts. So, so it'll be like, as we say, like, you know, I'm square, you know, meaning mm-hmm. that I am not a criminal. So right. being a square, sticking to square people, being right. around squares is cool. But right. when you're a young man, uh, coming of age, you know, um, you don't want to may be not necessarily your, you know, this this the guy you hoop with, and he ain't square. He's yeah. made a street decision, yeah. so now it it affiliates you. Yeah, you grew up with him when y'all both were street kids. Yeah, and and it's imminent danger involved in this, and this is how sometimes, as we say, the innocent bystanders. Yeah. Is murdered. Like, I mean, yeah. God bless the, the, the passing of like Ayanna Presley. And I was just yeah. talking about this on another podcast. But, you know, uh, the realism is, you know, as much as she shouldn't have been murdered by the police, the the grandson in the house shouldn't have been trapping out the out the grandma house where, you know, the kids yeah. are like these are parts of of the understanding yeah. in my mind of where street ethics come. But yeah. when you're a young man coming of age, and that's where no it gets OGs tough. OGs around because they've been, been sent to prison for. Uh, I think even if the o, even if cr- I would well, go as I'm, far I'm gonna as say, argue if the OGs were there, like here go the example I, I kicked to the little homies when I was. You know, maybe from the age of like eighteen to like twenty six, mm-hmm. I'm pro. You know, if if I hang out, you know, we hanging out with our friends almost every Friday and Saturday, mm-hmm. wherever we go, usually looking for girls. Uh, of these trips, maybe once every four trips, I'm sure I'm in the car with one of my friends with a pistol. Yeah. But I'm not even asking these questions. Yeah. And let alone asking, like, okay, is that a clean weapon? Is this not a clean weapon? Because yeah. I'm 23 and I just want to hang out with my friends. Yeah, that I drive to 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 go play arcade games at the Butterfly for me, but for a kid now, that drive for you just going out to Dave no, and Buster's could be the changing of your life. And your friendship, because he might slide this pistol under your seat. I get all of that. And But <clears throat> because you're at this age, it's hard to even – recognize Mm -hmm. and i think that that's one of the toughest things about that age 
for us as black men. Because yeah. even with my white homeboys, with the more I've met them, they were doing some of the same dumb shit too. Yeah. And carrying yeah, pistols, yeah. selling drugs, like everything we were doing. They were doing. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The George W. Bush story. But yeah. the difference is George W. Bush's father will make sure he doesn't end up in the situation and sentencing and is not allowed mm -hmm. to make, you know, this, you know, this guy that may have sold, you know. Five, you know, have five pounds of weed on yeah, them up north. Up north, whereas if you black, that pistol in your friend's car that's twenty six months. Five, yeah, and that's twenty six months when you graduate in high school. Yeah. So <laughs> now you heading into college, and now you behind on getting into college, and mm -hmm. now you got a you flagged up, and you, that and impacts you got a if felony. you can get financial aid, yeah. and you know it's like domino after domino after domino, all from like shit. I was just trying to go to Dave and Buster's with my homeboy. <laughs> I just was trying to protect myself because I live next door to the dope house where people is crazy. All of that. I, I, I get all of that. Um, the only reason I have mentioned OGs, though, is because, like I said, I come from an area, Highland Park. They still did operate with certain rules, though. Yeah. I'm just being – that might be specific to my area so of my time. Yeah. But on Geneva, bro – at a time, it wasn't like you just going to be seeing people just out there like that. The uh -huh. guys I hung out with was serving out of the alley. They not serving on the front block. or You know, that just wasn't their thing. Mm -hmm. And the other crew that I hung out with, because I used to be at this pool hall on Florence and Woodward, they was robbers. But they had some level of ethics. Like, I'm not about to be robbing the old people. We looking for... Young drug dealers, custos, prostitutes, tricks, you know what I'm saying? This who they looking to rob, and they robbing people all night. But they not robbing, uh, like, they was like Cain. I ain't messing with no old folks, uh, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. No women, that wasn't they thing. Like, mm -hmm. So there was still some level of ethics, but if you was a part of that life, there was no ethics. And, and that... And that definitely makes sense. And, and I think that, like, because it can be so abundant in communities that we're talking about, like black communities, mm -hmm. you, you know, because the destructive resources are. They there. They're there. They're in front of us. And the stress is there for you to want to indulge in it. Yeah. And let me let me say this, too. Being a student at CAS saved me a lot of times. Hmm. For instance, like when you said that about Little Caesars, I instantly thought about when the narcs rolled up on me and my mans, we literally is just waiting for a slice of pizza. Uh -huh. And as we walking inside to go get our pizza, they damn near hit us with their car. Hmm. We square up like, man, who the f was these white boys? What's up? Mm -hmm. They jump out to my some don't run. We ain't, what we going to run for? Dude pull out his badge. Oh, it's y'all. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Grab us, throw us up against the car. We like 15, 16, man. You know, kind of rough houses a little bit, but when he sees my cast tech ID, it's like, oh, these are not the guys. Go ahead about your business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And part of why I didn't really feel like I fit in at cast, uh, I used to ride to Hamilton. The Woodward was too off the chain, man. <laughs> too many vagrants back. and... Yeah, the 50, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, the 53 like, done, uh, it's, it's been some yeah, stories about the 53. Like, man, you, you'd be on there, man. Somebody had just have a bowel movement on they self, come and stand right next to you. The, so the, I the rode to Hamilton wow. where it was more uh, high school kids. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys that I saw or was around and ended up being friends with lived in like Seven Mile, Livernois to Schaefer. Yeah. Now, where I was from in Highland Park, and this isn't true, I understand that now, but anybody who lived in the Curtis, Seven Mile, Livernois, all the way down to Schaefer and mm -hmm. had a brick house, we thought you had made it, bro. Like, mm -hmm. we thought every other hood was like our hood, as in they sell dope over here, woo, woo, woo. But if you lived over there, you spoiled, you made it. That's where I want to live when I grow up. That's mm -hmm. how I thought and the guys around me thought. So I didn't feel like I fit in the cast, mm -hmm. but I did love cast. I had a great experience at cast tech. And what I'm finding out now as I talk to people from cast is some of them was experiencing the same thing. It's just I think many were. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I like, think many were. We just didn't 
at that share age, that with each other. Yeah, at that you age, I mean? the, the connection wasn't made. Yeah, so, we, we just didn't share. So from Cass, where to? Eastern. Okay, Eastern Michigan. And Eastern Man. Michigan is one of those unique schools because I think of a lot of the larger universities – for some reason, Eastern does a good job of getting a lot of black kids from Detroit there, Man. even more so than Wayne State. Like, bro, it, what is it about Eastern that just Man. brings black Look, folks to that campus from Detroit? Let me let me say this too. Yeah, I, I hate. I gotta inter, I gotta interject this, man. Mm-hmm. Eastern has created so many giants mm-hmm. that put in work in Detroit. Yeah. My man's Dangelo Moore, Isaac, and Zoma, the guys that founded BMO, went to uh-huh. Eastern. Uh, my man's Dino mm. found it steep, went to Eastern. Mm. Uh, my man's Vu, he didn't go to Eastern, but dog would be with At me Eastern. and my man's Cap <laughs> he, be all on, the time. On campus all right. the time. He, <laughs> people probably thought he went to Eastern. Uh, um, New Era Detroit Zeke went to mm-hmm. Eastern. Um, my man's Phil Black, who does mentoring, went to Eastern. Yeah. Akaji went to Eastern. Mm-hmm. Uh, my man's Gurok. The dude that got Goo Rock, Seth Low Dollar, went to Eastern. Mm. So, like, it's giants that went to Eastern. And they was always themselves. But I saw them kind of, a lot of those dudes come up. Yeah. But what drew me to Eastern was, I'm going to be honest, I did not want to go to college. Mm. I wanted to go to trade school. I got into some trouble with one of my, one of my homeboys from, like, elementary. And because I got into some trouble... I just forfeited what I wanted to do and was like, you know what, mom and dad, whatever y'all want me to do, I'm going to do it. I got you. So they, my dad whole thing was, because I, I ain't going to lie, man, I was kind of doing some stupid stuff. I used to say I would be filling out college. I wasn't doing that. My dad tricked me into taking the SAT by saying, I'm going to let you use my car for the day. And I didn't have to go to school that day. So I just was like, all right, bet. Because I had to whip and I was able to do whatever I wanted with the day until I had to pick him up, I just took an SAT test and I did very well on the reading part. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into Eastern. Um, It wasn't by my own will, you know, none of that, man. But Eastern was a great experience. And then then at that age, you know, and that's what's so unique about uh, that that adolescent age, I'd say probably maybe – like 14 to maybe 23 yeah your parents may know what's best for you yeah and you're thinking to yourself this ain't for me this ain't for yeah. me but it's like they know you yeah you know so you get to eastern and, and what's what's kicking off man everything is jumping off at eastern man i ended up rooming with this dude from southfield and he used to trip me out uh-huh. this dude had a 30 round ruger and was selling weed and i'm telling him like bro you can't do this out of my room uh-huh. Flat the fuck out. Like, and I'm talking mm. to him like this. I just met him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we end up being tight. Yeah. And basically, I went home for a weekend, and they switched my room to the suite mate. But none of them looked at me like cool because he had told them, because they were from Pontiac and Saginaw. He yeah. from Highland Park. We're going to have to watch this motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Hilarious. But I ended up being tight with my guy from Saginaw, too. Yeah, but at the end Saginaw, of the day, and you know when you go up there, Saginaw oh yeah, got you know it's it's, it's Saginaw all has some beautiful it's, women at Eastern too, man. It's, con- it's country, man. but it, it's, yeah. it's similar. <laughs> you already know. Uh, I lived in Best Hall. Mm-hmm. The the fl- the that year was probably the lavish dorm. Mm-hmm. Um, was co-ed. Man, it was just a great experience, man. And I learned a lot, man. Like how you were saying, you got white friends now, and. Yeah. You learn this, that, and the third. I learned that from them. Like, uh, a lot of y'all did live like us. Yeah. And a lot of y'all, y'all not really that much different. Y'all are different. And a lot of y'all have been programmed yes. to look at us a certain way. But, you know, with them being young enough to recognize, like, well, that was bullshit. And us also, we looking like. Y'all don't act like the white people we saw on Beverly Hills 90210 nah. and Saved by the Bell. No, so, no, no. Yeah. So it kind of opened me up as a human being mm. also. Like, it made me recognize that. Um, I also went under the wing of a great professor named Dr. Melvin Peters. 
Ah, Dr. Peters. Dr. Peters Dr. is, uh, Peters world, is renowned, big. Yeah. world renowned uh, when it comes to uh, black Africana studies, black yes. studies. Um, put the spark in Baba Malik. Yeah, Baba Malik Ikini. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. He put that spark in him. So I was under his wing. I took every one of his classes. We wow. used to sit outside, smoke squares together, and really just kick it. He was like my father on campus, uh-huh. just being honest. Um, and... And it was like I said, man, it was just a great experience. It took me six years. Mm-hmm. I fucked around my first year. I ain't gonna lie. Yep. Um, It'd be like that. It'd be like that. And you know, I, I, you know, I had my struggles. Even like my man's Don. Like, um, like I said, he always been the same dude. He was about his money, but he always was into helping people. We end up getting him fired because we. We blew all our flex money, and because he was such a good brother, he just started sneaking us into his job to where we could get the buffet. Uh. And we taking food out of the, like, you wasn't supposed to do that, but he put it on the line for us. But you know what I mean? It was just, it was a lot of different layered experiences, man. Okay. Um, Got into some trouble up there Mm -hmm. for shit that I didn't even do in certain times. Uh, they, They wrote me up. Me and my man's Miliato, produced by B. Mills. We sitting outside listening to the Nas album. Um, police just roll up on us, no reason. It was a cop named Buck. Mm-hmm. He was a literal black dude named Buck. Hilarious. He was. I'm dead serious, bro. He was like so adamant and hyped up to put us up against the car, and then the uh, white cop was like, "Search the car, Buck." And I'm I'm dead serious, bro. He was like mm-hmm. a canine dog in the car. Mm. He found uh, my man stash. Yeah, small amount of you know some just get by hustle shit. And um, my man's took the rap. He was a man about his like Diallas didn't know nothing about this. Yep. But I still got in trouble. And, Damn, uh, this is that scenario I just mentioned. This is crazy. Like, this is the scenario I, still, I just mentioned. Yeah, they still tried to give me like some type of trouble. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the scenario yeah. I just mentioned. Because this scenario happens, yeah. I, I know many of this happened to. B. Jessup and my father came up there for this judiciary thing. And mm-hmm. they spoke on my behalf. Like, man, he didn't have none. My dude yeah. just gave him a ride yeah. to class. How is he in trouble? And dude said he did not know nothing about this. Yeah, but you know how it is. Ignorance is not a defense Bruh, of the law. I got another, I got another story. I'm mm-hmm. not even there. My guys is in they room smoking weed. Mm-hmm. The the police come to they room. They dip to my room. My man Maris, God bless the dead, he hide up under uh the bed. The police come into my room, mm-hmm. open the door, and just start interrogating everybody in my room. Dudes wasn't even smoking in my room. Yeah. But because it was my room, like, I got a file. Like, bro, I'm in the library. What does you own? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, I mean, but these are these are some of those nuances and those realities yeah. uh, that, that do happen, you know. Facts. Uh, especially, you know, as they say, you know, birds of a feather flock together, as Man. they say. But the realism is the layers of our community. Man. We can be connected to, you know, you can be connected to... Gangsters and, and, Anything, and pastors and, and imams and and doulas and nurses. Listen. You know, you could you know, depending upon who you may connect to, you connect connect to a lot of people. But yeah. when it's us, you know, now that problem. comes with exactly yeah, a onus of like as if you know a person you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I, I hear the stories that yeah. he a gangster in the streets, but as far as I'm concerned, my relationship with him is yeah. we one hundred. You know, so that is that's a unique thing. So right now, um, you know, in leaving Eastern, you do a lot of work with little homies, specifically young black men. You mentioned BMO. What's BMO? Better. The Better Man Outreach Program. Uh, BMO was founded by my man's Isaac and Zoma. Okay. Angelo Moore. Don, like I said, I knew him at Eastern. I knew him since I was like 19. Yeah. They they opened it up. On Seven Mile and Evergreen area, okay. At the former St. Gerard, um, I first heard about it at my big homie Yusuf Shakur's nine years out party, 
And yep. when I bumped into him, and you know, Yusuf introduced him, I'm like, my man is on a new hustle. Hilarious. So I stepped to Don like, so where's the money at, bro? Like, yeah, you tell me like, about the hustle. You was like Shorty and Malcolm X. Yeah, when let you me saw in. Malcolm. Yeah, <laughs> let me in. Like, but I, it wasn't like I was on no. We was on nothing criminal. It was just like I know you getting some money from this. Yeah, yeah. I work with kids too at Starfish out in Inkster. Let me in. Cut me in. Let me get some money too. And Don looking at me like, Nah, man. It's just we really doing some community shit. We not even getting paid. And I'm like, You lying? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Um. Mm-hmm. Fast forward like three or four, three years. It's yeah. important that I put this out there. I was under the wing of Baba Chris, Baba Moodoo, Baba Jamai, and Baba Jeff. Jeff is Isaac's older brother. They had a rites of passage program at Insaroma Institute, mm-hmm. Bob and Balik School that he built and founded. Yep. I was working there as a building sub and was hired in as a gym teacher huh but seeing they rites of passage i loved it but i felt kind of like these youngsters don't really relate to it all the way because of the african centeredness of it now i'm not knocking it and i think that part is great so long as it's instilled from like the third fourth and fifth grade mm-hmm. but when you're dealing with somebody that's in the seventh or eighth grade and it what what made it click for me for real was it was an instance where this kid he just was being defiant and one of the bobbles was in his face talking about how does that line up with the seven principles of this that and the third and i'm thinking in my mind like man this little dude don't give a fuck about that right now so i just asked him like hey man so what's the real problem and he started telling me like how it was a domestic violence issue at his house. Yeah. So it's like, bro, all that shit go out the window. We got to deal with this first. So fast forward, of course, like I said, Jeff was telling me that the BMO thing was still going on. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, these dudes probably is serious. But I didn't fuck with it. I see Don at the grocery store and he like, um, we got Jay Zoo. We got a second sight. When he said that, I'm like, damn, I went to Jesu, and that's down the street from where I where I be at, Highland Park. Yeah. So I started coming. And once I came, I realized it's not what I thought it was. Wow. Um, and it's just a great program, man. They pray. That program helped instill prayer back into my life. Mm-hmm. It was about brotherhood. It was a place for me to also pull guys from my hood that might have been in the struggle to find something positive to do, uh, a positive place for us to link up. Uh, we help guys get jobs. We write up your community service and character letters uh, if you having trouble with the police or whatever. Uh, we help guys get into school, help them fill out their FAFSA, so on, et cetera. And also, man, like, it's just a brotherhood. It's a place you could go. And this straight up, you might bust out crying in the circle and nobody is going to judge you for it. How, uh, what ages? What ages? Uh, uh, it's 16 kids. and up okay. for the BMO program, which happens on Wednesday at the Tur- Durfee Life Remodel Center. So for and people that don't uh, want to know, that is where it's Central right next to Central High yep. School. That's on Wednesdays from 6 to 9. Okay. And then Friday at St. Cecilia from 6 to 9. Okay. Some days it's only 10 guys there. That's what I prefer because we can make a deeper connection and everything, and the run is good. And mm-hmm. some days it's 40 or 50. Okay. Like when we first opened up St. Cecilia, we had the steep program. We gave them a platform. They built up to, you know, move on to their own thing or whatever. But steep will have 30 guys fresh out of prison learning a skill trade. And then you had BMO, you know, and then you have all of these men together in one circle, praying together, talking about a topic, whether that topic is current events or how they feeling or what's going on at home. So you're talking about 60, 70 guys of Mm. all generations Mm. kicking it, bro. I never seen nothing like it. Um, And I learned a lot from them, man. It's a great program. We also got BW on Mondays at the Durfee Center for women. And then we got what I'm spearheading, which is BMO Juniors or the youth on Thursday, 6 to 8 at St. Cecilia. 
Okay. And of course, I have them in games on Saturdays. So it's like prevention, um, building camaraderie, helping people get a under, uh, uh, helping people get an understanding of who they are, and just giving giving people a game plan. Now, you mentioned the basketball. Yes, sir. And we're going to expand on that because you said you started with teaching gym and everything. And then you mentioned you even hooping. Um, so first, th- this will be twofold question. Mm-hmm. When it came to cash, you missed that one tryout. Did you lose some of the enthusiasm to even look at the next tryout? Or I lost uh, my enthusiasm for basketball with a fucked up coach in mm-hmm. seventh grade. He, okay. But I still played in eighth grade. I had a great season in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. I still hooped all through the summer. Like, hooping was my therapy. Like, people from Geneva cuss me out because I'm up at 8 in the morning dribbling my basketball up and down the block, just through my legs. Okay. Like, all day. And then I walk backwards doing it. Now, the reason I'm asking you this is just from the 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 – the kids perspective almost kind of talking to the parents that are watching because around that age sometimes kids will be very passionate about something Mm -hmm. and then just drop it Mm -hmm. you know and sports could be one of those things but it could be art it could be music it could be a lot of things but when you're getting into that adolescence where puberty's coming into play you know uh what role do you think a parent should play in encouraging that child because like we say sometimes when you're a kid you you're saying, nah, I don't want to do that. Yeah. But sometimes you do want that exposure for your child not to just be sitting around. And I think the parents should consume. force them to do something. And the reason explain, I say that. Explain when you say force them to force do something. Force them as in, bro, you don't even got, I'm not even looking for you to go to be the greatest or nothing. I just want you to go for exercise. I just want you to go for the socializing. Like, because... Once I missed that tryout, it wasn't that I didn't still like playing basketball. I still was hooping. But once I started smoking blunts, and then I learned that after you smoke a blunt, you could smoke a black and get you higher or a cigarette. By the time that the next tryout was coming, I knew I wasn't fit to even lace them up. You know what I'm Mm. saying? Because by August, I'm smoking blunts every day. And when I do try to hoop on the streets, I'm like – mediocre as hell so you see the difference because it's it's definitely so many marijuana smokers that say we don't do nothing to you now as a person that don't i I do think that marijuana does have an impact on people it does um but i'm saying mm -hmm. see marijuana for me was a gateway and i ain't talking about to no hardcore shit like Mm -hmm. x or crack or coke because i had a dad though that kind of talked to me about drugs but it Mm -hmm. was a gateway to newports yeah. Alcohol. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And people who went to cash with me know this. Man, I used to come to school blowed as fuck, man. I'm talking about ENJ, uh, Seagram's Jam. My my sister was like worried about me. Bottom shelf shit. At that, I mean, that's what kids, I could afford I was I, say, in that's 11th kids, grade. Yeah, that's what I then I had a homeboy who his hustle was, I ain't going to say his name, but he was my dog, and everybody remember this. His hustle was he worked at the grocery store, the Kmart, uh, I think, or Farmer Jack, and he used to steal fifths and pints. And it's like, now nah, it's really on, bro. We getting fucked up at every football game, and it was just crazy, man. And I just fell into bad habits. He was an athlete too, mm. but we just fell into those bad habits. So when I say force, it would have kind of kept me – out of some of those bad habits, you're not about to be going to practice fucked up like that. You're going to yeah. throw up. Yeah. And I see it with the kids I deal with now. Like, they 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 teeter-totter because they got me. And I'm one of them coaches that's, nah, bro, I'm going to pick you up. Where's you at? I'm coming to your crib right now. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I kind of try to keep them balanced off. So when you talk about like just encouraging a child to be active in something, mm-hmm. because that is the age where I don't, Get into I, maybe it. like 12 to 15, everything's boring and stupid. Almost. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you don't package it and present it. So uh, how does a parent encourage that child to do something when the kid just sitting around like, oh, that's stupid. I don't like it. I don't like it. I would say you run into that. Yeah. I would say expose them to different things. Until they find something that they like. So, like my daughter, 
she don't want to do basketball, but she says she like training with me. Okay, I get what that is. You like to just be with your dad. But mm-hmm. then she liked to draw. Uh, we tried to have her in like a, a piano. She really wasn't into that. But she mm-hmm. into karate. You know what I'm saying? Like we just had to, it's a matter of just keep pushing buttons. Okay, so you like karate. Bet. This what you into then. We going to rock with this. But it's all a matter of don't let them be inactive. And I think parents, once kids turn 13 or 14, and I see this a lot with coaching, they stop being as involved. That's really the most crucial time. I think I think that definitely happens because sometimes you get a, a kid that's, you know, even with me, that'll get lackadaisical, mm-hmm. act uninterested in everything, and you feel like, all right, they old enough to be by themselves, and I right. can kind of get back to – you know, this extra couple hours over here, I can work some overtime or mm-hmm. I can do some. And you're right. That usually is kind of that disconnect, I, yeah. like 11 to 16. Right. You know, And, and I'm, I'm, I got to add this, too. I got to punch this in because this is something new. It's a new initiative I'm launching. It's my business, CDE, which stands for Child Development Enrichment. Mm-hmm. Our whole thing is we give people or we don't give you nothing. We help you develop an individualized game plan for yourself. And the whole point that we want to do is we want to help you find yourself because when you find yourself, you're going to align yourself with God. We fall off of God's path when we decide to try to fit in or be like other people. So that's the first thing we want to do. Our game plan is to help you find yourself to be aligned with God. We want you to practice your interests to turn it into a craft that you could perfect. We want you to strengthen your weaknesses. We want you to exercise, and we want you to be proactive. If you proactive, you're going to be preventing yourself from falling into others' game plans. And this is the thing. Mm -hmm. There is people planning on you to go to prison. Why else is they investing in prisons? You feel what I'm saying? So CDE, CDE, BMO, we got a partnership. Our thing is we come up with an individualized game plan and we try to help kids execute that game plan, whatever it may be. So, you know, that's that's what I think that parents need to do as well, though. You need to teach your kids accountability at an age of seven, eight, nine so they can practice it. And, and let's it. let's unpack that a little bit more, too, because this age is a little bit different. Yes. Just being that the 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 cell phone device and social media has oh, changed man. the communication skills, I think, of even man. younger people. Let alone what they're interested in, how their interests are. You know, uh, before, you know, um, we of the same era. Like going outside was everything for me. It was everything. I mean, to the point where, like, you know, we were we were tracking counting down days. Like we was, you know, getting out of a twenty five year yeah. bid to. We to get in a, get a damn driver's permit, you know yeah, what I'm saying? License. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, a kid, you know, a kid, you know, Man. it's people that it's kids that may not even want their driver's license till they're 21 it's, because it's, outside to them is Instagram. Man, and, and out they don't even know how good side of the house faucet water is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. So when we think about that being a parent and encouraging that child mm-hmm. to do something in that age range. That can be impactful, but it also can be intimidating because, like I say, nowadays, it, just even communicating with a kid mm-hmm. just due to social media and that being their lifestyle. I mean, how how do you how do you effectively kind of go through these resources? Because you may be trying all types of stuff. You try to get an instrument for your kid, then right. then they want soccer, then they want football, then right. they want baseball, then they want volleyball. Like, right. how do you offer all of those things to a child while still you I'm, know, and keeping them engaged and not running yourself crazy mm-hmm. with the stuff you got to do just as an adult yourself. Got to have tough skin. Um, hmm. And you have to be willing to recognize and understand that a child's mind travels a lot faster than ours. Explain that. What they imagine, they still have imagination. We've mm-hmm. been kind of beat down by society to yeah. try to assimilate and accommodate to survive a child don't have that a child still have a vibrant tough spirit mm. so at the end of the day like we just had a um we just had a, a a big launch of cde bmo partnership 
where we had a, a summer camp. Mm -hmm. And our thing about the summer camp was to incorporate a, a stronger piece of literacy. But we used basketball. So most of the children that signed up were already interested in basketball. That's the carrot. But it's mm -hmm. also something that we use to show them, like, exercise is positive. Exercise is good. For example, one of our conversations was about diabetes, mm -hmm. where we read about diabetes. They don't realize, like, what you're really doing, bro, is reading. And then you're reflecting on it through conversation and journaling. That's literacy. So you yeah. got to kind of sneak stuff in and you got to keep it spicy. But also, a lot of these programs, and this is why a lot of them have a hard time, they don't listen to the kid or the child. They trying to push their agenda. Mm -hmm. They trying to push their agenda. And this is something that I learned from BMO. You have to listen to what the people want, bro. You can't just push your agenda and be saying, well, they don't want it. No, they don't want that shit you pushing. They okay. want what they want. So at the beginning of the program, I asked the children, what is your interest? What do you like to do? Mm -hmm. What do you want to learn about? Do you want to learn? Uh, and what are your goals? And if they don't know what a goal is, I explain to them, well, a goal is something that you want to do with yourself within the next week or the next two weeks that will make you happy or make you feel accomplished. And you base the program off that. So with this, your love in basketball for this, because uh -huh. you end up obviously going back to basketball because I yes. know you as a coach, uh, I've given to some efforts you've done in yes, fundraising sir. and others I have. appreciate you. Uh, what, what led for you to get into coaching? Because coaching is completely different. And I really tip my hat to you because nowadays, just even in playing pickup games, Man. like it's it, these kids it, it just – and I understand because they grew prompt. up watching uh, Steph Curry. Like, you know, yeah. these kids will get a rebound and run right out to the three-point line. Yeah. So, like, what – how did you get into coaching? Uh, what's it? What's that experience been like for you? Coaching for me, and I always tip my hat to my mans, Baba Moodoo and Baba mm -hmm. Jamal. Uh, they was big influences on my coaching and my dad. Okay. But coaching for me, the whole point of – being a basketball coach was to actually just relate to the kids better. Okay, okay. I, I don't really believe that you're going to really relate to most children in the classroom. Yeah. You got to relate to them on something outside of the classroom. That makes sense, especially especially some of us. Yes. Um. So what's, what's the experience been like as far as just getting them and fundamentals as far as listening to them? Because mm -hmm. I, just looking at the game, like – even this past NBA playoffs, which I love the NBA. Basketball is my favorite sport. But it just feels so different. And it's, it's a lot of people I know now. that it's a lot of people I know that don't even really watch as much as they mm -hmm. used to. Kind of like how I've transitioned from not really watching football anymore. But um like when you say listening to the kids, what are their goals when they go out there and and and, and what are they looking to learn? Mm -hmm. What's their what's their basketball goals? Like, you know, how's a little homie looking at basketball now so nine times out of ten especially when you're talking about young ones they off top say they want to go to the nba i'm never gonna step on no kid dream mm -hmm. but how i try to make it more feasible is well what's your goal for the end of the summer okay and they might say i want to be able to dribble better okay they might even say something as wild like my daughter was like i want to be a vegetarian okay it didn't have nothing to do with basketball. But the mm -hmm. whole point is to honor their voice and hold them accountable. So the next time I see you or the next week I see you, when I ask you about it, one, you know that I actually did study and remember what you said. But two, now you got to share out, not just to me, but to your peer group. So it's about teaching accountability. Okay. As far as the goal, it's not really – the basketball isn't important. That's just the carrot. But I the basketball you. is also a way – a lot of times I can't do it so much now, but to, for me to assert my dominance because kids mm -hmm. will test you and you can't spank kids no more. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I'm still the big dog, and okay, that so translates. You, you to hit them. them with the mid range game, and they looking at you like, "Why would you Boy, shoot you know, such I'm a low percentage shot?" <laughs> Bruh, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. These young brothers, especially teenagers, will see me, and because I might look young or whatever, they will try to test me. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's not a lot of people who want to interact with young brothers. 
Mm -hmm. because they are going to test you. Yeah. And if you don't have ultimate patience yourself to be able to articulate yourself, one of the best ways to show them, like, little bro, I can still punish you is on the court. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? When I box you out, you're going to realize, like, okay, coach really could handle me if he really wanted to. Okay. But it's out of love that he don't. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But also, I you could teach through basketball. Bro, you really going to quit on the court? You really going to shout at him for missing a layup? You didn't get back on defense? Like, is that proper communication? Is you giving 110% to be cutting into him like that? Mm. Let me do the yelling. Build him up. Like, you teach basic communication with basketball, but you also just do it off the court. And it teaches accountability. And, and with it, too, I, 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 cause like I say, I love it, but I look at the game. It's just so different now. Mm -hmm. Um, I would wonder, like, how do the kids take to some of the fundamentals? Do you still teach some more of the fundamentals? Are you focusing yeah. on three pointers more? Are you just focusing on crossovers more? Cause I mean, like what? I'm a simple what is guy. It? I'm real simple, bro. Um, I want you to be able to make layups. I want you to be able to dribble. I want you to be able to pass. I want you to be able to use the triple threat. And after we get through that, you do what you want to do. So when mm -hmm. I put the chairs out and I say bust a move and shoot, if you want to bust a move, step back and shoot the tray back, okay, you better do that move over and over until you perfect it. Or if you want to bust a move, spin behind the back, throw it up off the wrong leg, that's cool. But you better know how to triple threat, pass, play defense, and make your layups. Okay, let's talk oh, a little yeah. bit about that. Because mm -hmm. this is really teaching, and, and I'm a basketball fan, so we got to unpack this. Okay. Playing defense. How are Man. you teaching defense now because the game is even so different? And then how do the kids take to defense? Because I don't even know who kids look to, like, um, you know, like when you're, when you're like, hey, look at this person's defense. Mm -hmm. Like when we were kids, it's like Joe D got, Joe D got yeah. the clamps. Joe Dumars can clamp up Jordan. Like, and then you would look at the way that – Joe Dumar's footwork with move a player to one side or right. the other side, and you're like, okay, this is good defense. Practice. So I do the same things over and over. So instead of running suicides, my man Jamal always say, we ain't going to kill ourselves. We call them monsters. So you defensive slide to the free throw. You got to smack the flow, and you got to sprint back to the baseline. You defensive slide to the half court, smack the flow, basically like suicides. I got another drill where it's like you defensive slide from elbow to elbow for, for like three, four minutes. That's very tiresome. Yeah. But it's teaching you mental toughness. Mm -hmm. The other drill is um, you all feet, hands behind your back. You're going to check everybody. They're going to dribble to the half court line, and your job is to cut them off, and then you check the next dude. Like It's just about building toughness. Also, I, I teach through rotations. But a lot of times, because I'm a freelance guy and I listen to my players, they change my defenses. Hmm. So I had a defense called Dog Pound. It was a full court 1-3-1. One, one. And my guys, uh, they just kind of alternated it. And because it worked, I didn't stop them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, my players have that type of freedom. So, like, if somebody was to sit in the car with me and one of my players riding, and we talked about this earlier, about kind of getting in with that hood crowd so you wouldn't be fooled, one of my players shared that same sentiment with me. And I was glad he was comfortable enough to tell it to me because I know he wouldn't tell another adult that. Mm -hmm. But, like, they, they free to express themselves as they please. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell them all the time, man, if you cuss, you cuss, man. But when women and grandmas is around ain't no cussing but yeah. if we it's just us yeah express yourself how you feel down this is not the little kids i'm talking about this is for the 14s to 17 year olds express how you feel man you got this safe place to be you the only thing i'm not gonna tolerate is you calling the the, the young ladies yeah you know h's and b's i'm gonna check you on that little bruh if you keep talking like that you're gonna really believe it one day and that's, that can't happen on my watch. Or, or calling the brothers just nigga this, nigga, nigga, nigga. I can't tolerate that. Yeah. But anything else, bro, express yourself. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's really how it is, man. I, 
it's not really about what's on the court. It's about making them it's open about to the, the 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 opportunity that you create beyond the court. So just to be can, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Just be you to whatever capacity. And I'm only here to help you be your best you. And it would okay. be kids that didn't even hoop that just used to like to ride to the games. All right. So, so um, with that, as as I'm I'm wrapping up with most of my questions, I know of some okay. other things you wanted to point on, and. Uh, point out and you know touch on but yes. before we get there how do people give to bmo and what you're doing with cde uh you can make donations um man follow follow me on instagram coach underscore creed 313 um follow me dialis allen on facebook um we have a website the bmo program.org that's not da Mm -hmm. It's T-H-E-B-M-O okay. <laughs> program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M dot okay. org. Um, okay. And you can follow us on there. You can follow my man's Don. Uh, his name is B-M-O Don Jalo Moore on Facebook and the Better Man Outreach program on Instagram. Man, and, and, and here's the other part I want to throw out there, man. Donations, it don't just need to be money. Sometimes we just need materials, okay. Gatorades. Um, basketballs, yeah. practice jerseys, all of that stuff count, man. Okay. Yep. All right. So, what are some of the other things you wanted to touch on before I get to the classic Detroit is different questions and we wrap? Um, one of the things I, I wanted to touch on is just a few things, man. Like third party politics, right? Because mm -hmm. we talk about all of this stuff that we going through is impacted by legislation, ordinances, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. especially with everything that just jumped off. Now, I don't know exactly what happened or who did what, but at the end of the day, I want people to start considering third party politics for a number of reasons. The main reason is I believe the Republicans and the Democratic Party have kind of like lost touch. Mm -hmm. Um, the president right now is 70 plus years old. He doesn't even represent 25% of the population. So why is he our president if politics is supposed to be a representative thing? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe if there was a third party that was viable to win, then, you know, it would make the other two parties a little bit more honest and representative. But mm -hmm. what's going on right now is just it's just not viable. And the people that's voting is token voting. Yeah. They they token voting and they're good with a symbolic gesture. I don't really believe that the people that's not voting um is just that apathetic. I believe I believe in people. If they had a, a proper candidate who spoke for them, they will vote. And I say that because we talk about this with, with a lot of young men. Um, and that, that just was one of the things I, I wanted to know what you thought about that, too. Well, I, I, I go as far as, you know, my mind and critical thought, like you say, being around critical thinkers. I don't think the president ever was representative. of. The, I mean, you know, I, I think that, you know, since the inception of when we think of the roots of this nation and okay. what this nation represents and the ideals of this nation versus the actions of this nation mm -hmm. I, I think it's apropos for for what america is you know okay you know and uh and apathy is present uh there would be yeah. more people involved but it gets back to the design of what i think america's for design is for um the design of america has and always be what's labeled as white so germanic french mm -hmm. and english white men uh usually like above the age of like 30 something to own and con and control mm -hmm. all assets and resources of this nation that is what america is now whether we put it in the box of capitalism democracy or whatever <coughs> mm -hmm. that's what america is okay. so i i would argue that yeah a different type of candidate would inspire uh m more voters Yes. But a different type of candidate to even exist in this system. Like, it, it's like you're playing outside. It would you know be what I'm difficult. Like, yeah. Like, like, it'd be like you're trying to play chess in a checkers game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or vice versa. Like, you're, it would be different. It, it, 
it ain't designed to be that candidate. And it's not, but see, the way I look at it is just like when Yusuf was going to run, I was excited, yeah. bro. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was like, this is what we need. Or even like a lot of people don't know about my man, John Alumba. Mm -hmm. John Alumba ran as a Democrat, but when he saw what it was, he went independent. Yeah. And, the, and what's crazy, though, is people didn't support that. That's a problem, and he need that support. I mean, he needed that support. So if we, I just feel like, man, if we want to see things different legislatively, we have to do different. We have to try different things. Uh, I see what you're saying too, though. Um, mm -hmm. Politics hasn't worked for us majority of the time. I will say that. I'm not gonna say all the time. No. But majority of the time, it hasn't. But but most. But I mean, it, it's one of those overarching things. But. All American institutions, like like you, like I say, I, I just look at it like let's look at the design of how this helps land owning white men, land owning business, business having white men, mm -hmm. and then how it connects to them, and then we can unpack it. But it's all forms of institutions: so mm -hmm. uh, political, educational, uh, yeah. medical, yeah. Uh, entrepreneurial, like all institutions in America are not designed for the black community. And so the, when we understand that, we got to recognize how to play on the field. It's, it's, like, it's yeah. like, you know, the example, you know, this is a classic one for, for basketball. You mm -hmm. know, I played basketball as a kid too. And when you go in that other person's backyard, and that's what we are. We're playing yeah. basketball in their backyard. backyard. But so we can we, win. Yeah, we can win, but we got to know that we're going to step out and we – it wasn't out of bounds for them, but it's out of bounds right, for us. Right. We're going to know that the two-point line, I, I swear this was a two, but they're going to say, no, nah, that's a one. They we got to know it's going to so backboard and all of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're going to push you into the bushes, the, the sticker bushes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They know that. So mm -hmm. being that we know that it's it's a rigged game, how do we play in this rigged game? Right, right. What are our? How do we make our disadvantages our advantage? And okay. it's a lot of disadvantages that can be advantageous to us. And one of the key ones in a city like Detroit or Highland Park is the fact that because there's so many parts of this sit in these both those cities that just aren't seen and looked at. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of stuff here that you can't do. Like if you talk to your homeboys in New York or L.A. Right. Or, or Philadelphia yeah. where land just is not accessible. And it costs a lot more. Yeah. 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 Whereas here. Yeah, you know, you, you can have, you know, you can gangster some land here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Every every inch to be thought of in New York City is 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 occupied. Yes. By established yes. Uh, groups. Yeah. Whereas it's acres of land in Detroit. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I, you I can agree. activate. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can gangster the land if you choose, but you can even do it to buying the plot of land where people are, aren't even thinking about, and you can kind of do your own thing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. You know, and that's a disadvantage to an advantage because it's labeled as blighted, but you can do your own thing. Yeah, you can build a, a, a farm. You can build farms. You can a build playground. playgrounds. You can... You can build structures. I mean, yeah. it's, you could get shipping containers. You could do a lot of stuff, yeah. but you got to look and know we're going to do this differently. And I think it'll take the type of political candidate to move in that way. I, that's, and that's what I mean by third-party politics. Mm -hmm. Because part of being at BMO is you have to be a registered voter. Yep. And it's not we don't tell you who to vote for. We don't tell you how to vote. None of that. It's not our business. But we make you become a voter because you might be able to sit on a jury pool. Yeah. Every time I ever been called for jury duty, I'm just excused immediately by the prosecutor. Get that motherfucker out of here. You yeah. feel what I'm saying? But they, you could be up here. You you know, the that's situations what I'm you went into. Yeah. But part of the thing is, though, out of the people that's there at Wayne County when I was called, it wasn't a lot of guys that looked like oh, me. Oh, not either. at all. Not and, at all. That's because they don't be registered to vote or they just don't show up. But we yeah. got to start doing that, man. Definitely. But um, the other thing, man, and I, I'm not going to hold you up much longer. Um, what's your thoughts about, like, um, the police having a different type of structure? And I, I, let me just throw it out there like this because 
like you mentioned Highland Park, one of my guys, and I know he's not a lame, he's not a square, he not with that prototypical police mentality. He really felt like he wanted to protect his neighborhood in an institutionalized way. Um, so he ended up becoming a police officer in the neighborhood we grew up in, man. And I think that's great. I think we should have more of that. But there's also things that I see similar to police as teachers in my profession as an educator. We get breaks for a reason. A lot of people think that teachers got it made and woo, woo, woo. But many people have seen from this pandemic, man, your child is a lot to deal with. And he not even all of that. You yeah. got five hey. kids that's really off the chain. Yeah. And you have no idea. But we dealing with 25 kids. Maybe seven of them is really here to flat out learn. Ten of them is here to socialize. And then you got problems out of five or six or whatever. But yeah. um, the reason why teachers get these breaks is because they need that time to recalibrate so they don't burn out. And I... I I okay. Well, I was you, talking about the police, though. You, in, you I'm mentioned using two that as a parallel. So let's start. Let's start with the police. Let's go. My thing it's is, kind of go. Oh, my bad. Go. No, no, yeah, my my thing is, and I'm just projecting this out there. Yeah. For brothers like you and I, who mm -hmm. are creative and articulate and trying to make change, why not let them work the streets for two months, and then give them like some soft work for th for a month. And also, give them that two, three months vacation time. And the reason I say that is, I don't care how good of your intentions is, if you get called to deal with problems and problematic people all day, every day, after so long, bro, you're going to internalize some of that and become jaded and bitter. Like, some of these police out here is like, they got that cowboy mentality, but they didn't come in with that mentality. And I'm looking at it from a humanistic point of view. Okay. Um, and, and that's where, like, I agree with you on all those points. But I, I got to always go back to the inception of it. Yeah. And policing. Slave catchers. Yes. But more. Yeah. Slave catchers. But, was. but even more so than the reason they were slave catchers, it kind of goes back to America's institutions are designed right. to protect white men with businesses and white men with property that's correct. we were once property so that was the inception of it so it's like you know like if you build a house on a foundation that's sinking and that's what the justice system in america is if you're one of us mm -hmm. but it's working completely fine for others you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. we're 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 in a like you look at like uh any any criminal enterprise, right? you know, and you compare that to Detroiters now, and they only went back like about seven years. It's been established that the city of Detroit has overtaxed Detroiters for their tax oh, property. Man, could, to I me, that's that's a yeah. criminal. That, that is, is a criminal offense. It is. But due to the structure and in the system, insurance. <laughs> due to the structure in the system, it's not going to, unlike the, the insurance right. has not been called out like this was like, yeah, we know we were overtaxing yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying? But now all of a sudden the taxes get adjusted as more, uh, as more non-black Detroiters come to Detroit. Right. As Detroit becomes more gentrified, the right. taxes go back to a level that are more reasonable. And, and people <laughs> lost their homes. That's some real gangster criminal yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, economic yeah, violence. Sure. But is. because it's them doing no it to us. Though. Yeah, because. We don't have representation. But, it, but will we ever have it? Because, like I say, we're not rich white men. You know what I'm saying? The I see what you're saying, but this is where I disagree. Okay. I disagree because, yeah, it might have started that way, but even rich white men respect and power people period and i use this as an example and i saw this in the book the slave community i've read it about three four times those white men who so-called own the witch doctor and all of that they still bow down to the witch doctor they wrote about it in their diaries and everything power respect power so like um somebody that's empowered and organized it don't matter what color you is 
if we would empower and organize behind representation who knew the law and was able to articulate the law and they knew that if you came for this person there's going to be physical repercussions i think we would be able to get more done because i just believe power respect power well i mean and th this is the tough thing i, I agree with you there like mm -hmm. i mean it's a you know this is their term the what's in it for me it's right. a what's in it for me the you. functionality of not just the witch doctor but the engineering when we think of all the inventions and all the science mm -hmm. it, yeah. it was yeah. it was needed as as you know i don't know how i see what you're saying information yeah, like I see what you're saying. so the 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 culture on a plantation even though we were recognized legally as property mm. there were definitely people that were enslaved that had influence over what mm. would happen in the business of a plantation even more than what i guess would be known as the plantation owner right, or the right. quote unquote master because this person knows the crops and knows the soil a whole lot more yeah, so yeah, like yeah. It, it's like you, you know you what I'm don't saying? respect puts, him because it helps me i yes, get what you're saying yeah, but yeah. But we got to look at it through their lens. So you. we just need to make sure that whoever those officers are have the, the presence of mind and the consciousness of knowing the lay of the, the, the institution of justice mm -hmm. and also the lay of the culture in our community. Yeah. Because even with that, as we know, you know, the relationship between criminals and cops, yeah. which in a lot of ways, I think Sometimes it's a blurry we'll line. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's very well known. Yeah. You know, yeah, the yeah. only thing that kind of makes it not as well known, and, and it's funny because I love it too, is my, my favorite culture of hip hop because hip hop has reanimated mm -hmm. what we look at as street life to make it seem as criminals are not as involved. When in reality, criminals and cops are, are, are symbiotic. Like yeah. the relationship, you know, cops need criminals. They would not have a job if it wasn't for the criminal. If it you wasn't for the threat of crime, yeah. you know. So the 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 and, and even more than that, when you have a black officer that has a consciousness and has a idea of where culture stands, mm -hmm. even the most hardened criminals will will respond well uh, yeah. to to what that is. But also that 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 cop needs to understand the premise of of where the origins of what this system did. Just like even me doing media. Mm -hmm. I know the origins of media when it comes to black people in media. Right. But it doesn't mean I can't independently do it. Right. I just need to be aware of how I'm engaging with this. Right. Right. You know, and that's where I think keeping that consciousness of knowing of knowing that we we engaged we we engage with social capital. We engage with community. That's adverse to the rugged individualism and the uh in the in the in the gamesmanship of their culture but that and when we understand that now we can kind of know how to communicate and how to engage outside of black culture right that's a, that's how i see it and we need yeah. to be cognizant of that and even within black culture when we see another black person that's engaging in the rugged individualism and the gamesmanship we need to understand this is his interpretation of what white success is but black success is this so when that off when that officer has it has ingratiated himself with the community values of what black success of that neighborhood is not only is that advantageous and smart it's beautiful but right. i say not just that for the not just for the officer but for the criminal too yeah and it's I been mean, many it's, it's been many gangsters that have given to the community abundantly yeah and and and, and, and some of that abundance ain't necessarily the turkey dinners yeah. but it's just like what you say the code of knowing no nope, we gonna sell crack in the back yeah all right we're not gonna do nothing over here on this block because we respect mrs whoever whatever yeah, yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. if if these people <laughs> broke in her house we gonna make sure whoever did that is gonna be found and, and these are gangsters that, is, that yeah. interact no stuff with is gonna be returned. safety yeah. yes these are gangsters yeah. that interact yeah. patrolling and making sure the community is safe right you know so i would say whomever is in our community needs to click into that consciousness i agree with that and that's the whole thing that i'm trying to like push mm -hmm. like when I hear the young brothers say they want to be a, a police officer or yeah. they want to join the Marines, in my mind, I'd I be really, I'm not upset that they want to do it, but I'm upset that there's so much standoffish energy in our community not to water that plant so that he can be that protective force yeah. in our community. 
Yeah. Like, and, and we need to have, we need to have true representation. This all tied to that third party making everything legit and having true representation, not somebody that's persuasive, charismatic, charming, and could talk good, and they just gonna play the game. In many, in many so, communities, you know. I mean, even to the point where you know there's a council of elders here, but other communities have that too. So like, you may mm -hmm. commit a crime. That's a crime. Like, here's a classic one. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's a known fact and horrific, but it, it's a known fact of the of the priests that were molesting men, oh, I mean, but molesting the young boys and young men. But the Vatican itself has their own hierarchy of justice yeah. that America's just stepped back and letting them, Let them do this. handle yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. I think. We need that same type of code of ethics, whether it be like a council of elders for whatever it is, mm -hmm. because there are certain things on the books that aren't laws, yeah. but it's laws in our community. Yeah, and yeah, then it's yeah. certain things yeah. that are laws in their society and laws in our community where, you know, like, for instance, I don't know. I don't know what 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 an instance is, but let's say, you know, something tragic like a domestic violence. Our community should have a way of addressing yeah. what that is, too over and beyond what their justice system right. is because that's the other thing too because even when the justice system i guess implements justice in our community it's usually not justice in our community yeah we don't we don't really agree with a lot of what the justice what they see as yeah anyway yeah, yeah. so I totally agree with so you. having our own ideas that needs to you know mm -hmm. be communal and, and, and tap into that social capital and even talking about incarceration which is usually the outcome of the so-called yes. justice you know I, I mean we know people that's been mentally institutionalized i mean you're not supposed to be incarcerated if you've been mentally institutionalized in my opinion you need to be in a hospital bro you know I what mean, i'm saying if you i mean it's almost like rolling the dice and you work with young black men but yeah you talk to a group of young black men probably all I would say maybe 15 to 22, and you say, hey, how many of you guys in here think you're going to ever go to jail? Mm. And you'd be surprised how many hands go up. How many of them have been to jail? Is well, I'm saying, I'm just saying, let's, let's just ask that question. Yeah. Then you can ask the other question. Here go the other question that's disturbing. Once I had a group of kids, this was all middle school. This is before it mm -hmm. was even called BMO Juniors, but it mm -hmm. was leading to that. I said, man, how many of y'all in here are virgins? Mm. None of them raised their hand. Some and of that, I think, is also bro, a kid not one to listen, embarrass themselves. Listen, bro. listen, man. With Instagram and all of this crazy sh stuff out here, man. Yeah. You would be surprised how early. And even when I was a kid, man. Well, I don't like to talk about this, but yeah, it was guys in our generation losing their virginity in the sixth grade to the, the bus store or whatever. And it was not uncommon, bro. Like no, I, I I think I think some of it I call as a kid would say I call cap on because there was a lot of that going on in middle school. It do be but a it lot was of that. some truth. It was some truth in that too. And then also I, I think historically that's been, you know, sex Amen. and sexuality at a young age. And then what we label as young, you know that that has been uh, I've heard the term adultify, but. You know, sometimes that was younger, but incarceration to me is a newer phenomenon. And the idea of most young black men see jail or incarceration as something it's that is a possibility. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to. I'm going to be honest, though. We did, too. In Highland Park. We I mean, but I was going to say, yeah, I, I didn't say that my generation, it was different. Right. Nah, you know, yeah, if you, I'm you assuming know, over here. How many of you, yeah. you know, how many of you all see yourself living past the age of 30? You see how many people yeah. raise their hand. Like, so when we have these, when asking some 16 year olds, 25. Yeah. yeah. So so like when this when this destructive, when these destructive concepts are already accepted in your mind. So you've accepted this reality mm -hmm. when you talk about that imagination. Right. It, and this is the group of people you live in, yeah. you know, it, 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 yeah, it's going to stifle you. You know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the elephant, in the ball and chain. That's that. And that, that, that's why we emphasize having a plan and yeah. having a game plan. But man, I, like I said, them was just a few things I wanted yeah, yeah, to discuss yeah, myself. You said it was a couple more questions and we going to wrap it up. Yeah. Classic Detroit is different questions. What was your very first car? Uh, what year did you get in and what year make and model was it? 
It was a uh, 96 Cavalier. Okay. It was my dad's car, and I got it. What was that? My fourth year in college. So that was like 2003, 2004. Okay. Where's the first place you went when you got it? Probably the Shitteries. That was the eatery at okay. Eastern. You know. Okay. All right. Uh, you're the DJ at the end of the fireworks. Uh, Woodward and Jefferson, you get to play one song. What you playing? Damn, that's a tough one, dog. Um, I'm on Woodward and Jefferson. Yep. I'm playing Stevie Wonder, My Eyes Don't Cry No More. Okay, well, people are going to be hustling like ever. All day. <laughs> and last question. If you could rename Woodward after one Detroiter, who would it be and why? I would rename Woodward after my father. Okay, why? Um... My father has been a major inspiration in my life, mm -hmm. and I feel like he's inspired a lot of other people. But guys like him, is they're not going to go down in the history books like that. He never mm -hmm. pursued fame, office, or power like that. He just been a teacher, and, and, you know, he always liked to kick it to young brothers about life. Yep, I was one of them young brothers he would kick it with, and always raising Cain and uh, – in good old Professor Allen, Dr. Allen's class, yeah. and the boy, boy, Lewis College of Business. A lot of great stories there. Shout out to Dr. Bland, too. That yes, was my yes. Dad, uh, Gillespie, mm -hmm. RIP Dr. Green. Yep, yep. So All right. It. There we go. Thank All you. Right, thank man. you so much. No doubt, man. Thanks for having me, man. I, I feel like a legend now. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Detroit is different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.